your seats. How is everybody? Good. Bless? Yeah. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> We're having an awesome time in the presence of God. Amen. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, just as a disclaimer, my name is Paul. Everybody say hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Everybody say hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> my name is Paul, and I'm here uh, for our Brampton family. So if you're uh, new with us today, you might see me, sometimes you might. Use, but I'm so happy to be with you today. And just as a public disclaimer, a lot of you saw me today and said, where's the baby? <laughs> so, so I'll answer it here. So unfortunately, I bring greetings from Rachel and my baby, Harper. Uh, she's nine months old now. And unfortunately, they're not here because we do have a Thanksgiving celebration today at our house. So she has to prepare and do a lot of stuff. So you just have me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that okay? Okay, okay great. <laughs> Whew, that's out of the way. Anyways, they really regret. They really want to be here. Uh, it's a special weekend. And if you're new with us today, We'd like to thank you for joining us this long weekend. You know, there's no place that we'd rather be than in the house of God. Amen? So if you're new with us, please uh, connect with us. Uh, visit the Guest Information Center. Uh, we'd like to get to know you. We want to make sure that you're known here, uh, you're greeted, we get to know your name. So please take that time after the service, or if you have already, that's great. But we'd love to get to meet you. So this is a great weekend, not because we can eat whatever we want, but because it's Thanksgiving weekend, a time to be thankful, amen? So how would you describe Thanksgiving? I took this to the internet, obviously. I took it to google.com and I wrote in, how would I describe Thanksgiving? And I found a couple of responses from children that I thought I'd share with you today. So this is thankful, uh, thank you, BuzzFeed.com. We're just gonna read these little notes that they wrote. Okay, so the first one. This is what Hadassah, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name right, Hadassah. Almost seven says this. I like Thanksgiving, but it's like not one, it's, sorry, Hadassah. I like Thanksgiving, but it's not like one of my favorite holidays because you don't do really fun things, you just eat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the next one. This is from Jude. He says, the best part about Thanksgiving is the feast. Because, you know, I just like food. <laughs> Me too, Jude. Me too. This one I can really relate to. Kendra, age 6. So who says we have to eat turkey on Thanksgiving? Why not chicken? <laughs> I, I just recently started eating turkey. I think probably, how long do I know Rachel now? For like 10 years or whatever. But... She she introduced me to turkey, and I had the same question. Why can't I just eat chicken? Isn't it the same thing? Anyways, this is Joey, age 10. Thanksgiving is so stressful because my mom hardly ever makes turkey, mashed potatoes, and pie, so I have to eat a lot so I don't miss these things for the rest of the year. <laughs> That's true. And let's go to our last one. Caleb, age 7. My favorite thing about Thanksgiving is that we get to spend time together and eat delicious food, and it is wonderful. Oh, thank you, Caleb. <laughs> so all kidding aside, you know, Thanksgiving is it's a great weekend. Uh, but today, what we want to do with the time I have with you, I want to dig into what the Word says about thankfulness. So let's just pray. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that we can come, we can worship you. We thank you, God, that you're good, and you're our Father. And Lord Jesus, we pray today that you just open our eyes, Open our ears to just uh, know what you have for us today. Open our hearts to receive what you have. And God, we're just so thankful. We already posture ourselves in the, in the position of thankfulness this afternoon. And we pray have your way. God, I pray that I decrease and you increase. That every word that I said would be, oh God, from you and straight from you. Anything else that is not of you that would pass away. And God, that what is true and what is your word would stick to the hearts of people. We thank you, God. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So today we're going to turn to the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles with me, we're going to go John 6. John 6. And we're going to go with verses 1 to 13. And this is a familiar passage, and it might be really familiar to all of you, because it's the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. Okay, so we're going to start reading verse 6. 
It says, Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiber Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Verse 7. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 of them were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Thank God for his word, amen. This is a crazy story. Blows my mind every time that I read that God, you know, he would feed the 5,000. And what I want to do is I just want to take a moment to break the story down for a bit. You know, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he was, he was doing miracles. He was performing. He was healing the sick. He was teaching. And people were just gravitating gravitate towards him. You know, to the point where he looks up and a crowd is forming. You know... He looks up and he sees about 5,000 men. And the Bible says is that there may have been more than the 5,000 because only men were recorded. So children and women were excluded. So about more than 5,000. So how many, how many does this room fit? Does anybody know? How many does this room fit? Probably around maybe 200, 340, 345, 340. So imagine that, 340, and then imagine 5,000. So Jesus, you know, he fed these 5,000 people. He comes and he sees it, and he says to Philip, Philip, what are we going to do? He looks up at the crowd and he says, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed these people? You know, and I love the Bible because it's so honest. Philip turns back to Jesus and says, Jesus, wait a minute. It's going to take more than half a year's wages just for each person to have one bite. So we're not talking about full, we're not talking about, you know, lots, that just to have one bite, it would take more than half a year's wages. They then find this boy, God bless the boy, <laughs> with five barley loaves and two fish. And what does Jesus do? He takes it and he gives thanks. You know, he does the same with the fish. He takes the fish and he gives thanks. And then the miracle of God takes place. And he said they had more than enough. And then they were, everyone was full and they had baskets left over. You see, what I want to highlight here is that there was a great need. You know, and, and what Jesus had in the five loaves and two fish, it was not enough. But yet, Jesus was still thankful. So I'm going to say that again, that there was a great need, you know, to feed the 5,000. What Jesus had, five loaves, two fish, was not enough. But yet, he gave thanks. The title of my message today is, Don't Miss the Moment. Turn to your neighbor and say, Don't Miss the Moment. Don't miss the moment. You see, because so often, we have great needs. You know, we have these big needs, and we look down at what we have, and we see that we don't have enough. And so often, we miss the moment of thankfulness. We miss the moment of acknowledging God for those five loaves and two fish that He did provide. You know, Jesus didn't miss the moment. He was thankful. And in fact, it says in verse 6, when He was talking to Philip, it says that He was just testing Philip, because He already knew what He was going to do. 
He knew that God would multiply. He knew that there was, he was going to be able to perform a miracle. And friends, no matter what your need is today, no matter how big your need is today, no matter how big your financial need is today, God knows what He's going to do. Amen? And He's more than able to do it. Despite if there's a big gap between what you need and what you have. Despite that gap, we need to be thankful for what we have. You know, Jesus needed more than half a year's wages for everyone just to have one bite. All he had was the five loaves and two fish. That gap was huge. But yet, he was thankful. You know, don't miss the moment of thankfulness. Don't let how big the need is blind you from the provision and blessing that you have right now. Don't miss the moment. You know, Jesus didn't miss it. And John, he, the Gospel of John doesn't omit this key part. You know, describing the miracle. It would have been easy for him to just say, you know, Jesus, he came, he saw the need, he multiplied it, and everyone saw his infinite power. But you know, the Word of God is so intentional, and it's just a little, just a little moment in that passage where it says, he gave thanks. And it's, it, it's, I believe that, you know, when we're studying the Word of God, and we're studying the life of Jesus, that everything is intentional with Him. You know, He's always teaching, He's always demonstrating, He's always revealing God to us. So the fact for Him to take that moment just to give thanks was to teach us to also take that moment in our lives. You know, how many times have we missed the moment? And it's easy to miss the moment when we have more than enough, Right? God provided the new car. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, He provided the new house. Praise God. You know, you're standing before your Thanksgiving feast, and you're like, look at all this food. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You know, we go from this cycle of need, and then provision, and then back to the need. And then He provides, and then we go back to the need. You know, and then we, we, we miss that moment in between. You know, we, we miss... That moment where we can be thankful. You know, where we can acknowledge God for what He's already done and He's what He's already doing. It's that moment, you know, like just like the disciples were when they looked at that five loaves and two fish. That moment where they could have, where Jesus could have been like, oh, but He saw that and He gave thanks. Because the, that didn't cut it. The two loaves and the two, the five loaves and two fish didn't cut it. And how often do we look at our bank account and we say, it's not going to cut it. You know, we're assessing the needs of our family. Or we're thinking about how we can buy, you know, school supplies. How we can feed our children with, you know, the different food that we need. How are we going to buy the house that we need? This house is too small. Or we look at our family and we think, you know, how are we going to mend all these broken relationships? How are we going to end the fighting? We look at what we have and we say it's nearly not enough. It's those times where I challenge us as a church to not miss the moment. You know, the moment to give God praise for what He's already done in our lives. The moment that acknowledges the blessings He has already given us. Yes, Lord, I need a bigger house, but I'm thankful for the house that I have right now. Yes, Lord, I need healing, but I'm thankful for the loved ones in my life. Friends, He knows what He's going to do. Let's be thankful in the moments because what you have, He will use. Amen? What you see is not enough. Where you see that gap, He's able to close it. You know, and I remember preparing this message, and I felt like, you know, there's so many times I've missed the moment. You know, there's so many times, and I remember just studying this passage and feeling so burdened. You know, because in the natural, when we give, you know, you want to feel appreciated. Not the person to say thank you. You know, you, you give and you give out of the goodness of your heart and you're not looking for it, but you feel better when someone appreciates you. And for those of you who don't know my wife, her name is Rachel. And her love language, do you guys know the love languages? <laughs> so her love language is words of affirmation. So she really appreciates what I'm thankful for to thankful to her. You know, when I say thank you for doing the dishes. Thankful for helping me prepare this. Thank you for driving. Thank you for doing these things. 
you know, and, and it really means a lot to appreciate. And I just thought to God, and I said, God, like it would have meant so much to Him for me to be thankful. You know, when I, when I got all these things and all the provisions in my life, and just missing those moments to say, God, I'm so thankful. You know, I had to come to the Lord and I had to come and just apologize because He was so much more to me than this vending machine of good things, you know? Sometimes it's just like, okay, B12, I want the car. Okay, C12, I want the house. You know, he was just so much more to me than just this God who just gives me things. And I wanted to be thankful. So I, I came and I just, you know, knelt before God and said, God, I'm so sorry. And how many know he's good? Amen. And he just received me with open arms. So turn to your neighbor today and say, don't miss the moment. And then say to your neighbor, thank you for that encouragement. I put that a wiki face in my notes, but you guys don't see that. <laughs> so, with the time that I have left with you, I, I just want to go over some things. And the first thing is, why do we become ungrateful? Because we never want to be these people, am I right? We never want to be an unthankful person. But there's things in our life that we can catch, to catch ourselves to say, hey, what's happening? So we're going to go over why we become ungrateful, then we're going to go over the keys to unlock thankfulness. How do we make sure that, yes, maybe we're going through this rut of things are happening to us, but how do we make sure that thankfulness is a part of our everyday lives? So the first thing is why we become ungrateful. Question, this is a big question, and it's something that I ask myself, and it's, it's sometimes the reason why we miss the moments. And the first thing is that we often fall in to a poverty mentality. You know, and there's this popular illustration, and I'm sure you guys have heard it before. You know, well, there's two types of people. And if I get a glass of water, and I pour the water into the glass, about midway, there's two types of people. People who see the glass half empty, and people who see the glass half full. You see, the poverty mentality, I, I like to think, is someone who always sees the glass as half full. You know, where they always see the lack in everything. Someone who's always focused on what they don't have, rather than what they do have. You know, when they get caught up in that, I don't have the newest car, I don't have a boyfriend, I don't have a girlfriend, I don't have the money, I don't have a good job, I don't have the smarts. You know, we could have an amazing job, we could have a house, a car, food to eat on the table every day, but we end up focusing on the I don't have. And our wish list, it grows and grows and grows. And as we continue to dwell on the I don't haves, what we do have is forgotten. You know, friends, we need to start looking at our glass as half full. In fact, we need to look at our, our glass and say it's half full, but it will be overflowing. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, and I was curious, I did some research about, you know, how good do we have it in Canada? Because we know living in Canada, is, it's a great privilege. Amen? And I know a lot of people here came, immigrated to Canada because it's a better place to be. So I was looking at how good do we actually have it? And I came up across this Quality of Life Index. And for those of you who don't know the Quality of Life Index, what it does is it measures different factors and gives a country a number. Then all the countries are ranked in order of quality of life best to last. So it, it factors in purchasing power, it factors in safety, healthcare, cost of living, pollution, climate. And every country is ranked top to bottom out of 77. Canada right now is ranked number 17, total quality of life. This is according to Namio.com. You know, out of 77 countries living in Canada itself, us today have a better quality of life than majority of the world. Church, we have something to be thankful for. Amen? So let's not get stuck in the I don't have, because we do have. You know, it's funny, when I asked... When I was sharing this stat to a few people, you know, I was like, I'm going to tell you something, and tell me the first thing you think of. 
So I was like, Canada, do the whole speech, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, who's number one? <laughs> and that's the first thing I thought, too. Who's number one? You would automatically go into this, well, what do I don't have? When it, in reality, we're living in the top 20 in all of the world. And if we factor in population, and we talk about how many people there are in the bottom countries versus what we have, we're probably in the higher percent, like the, the, the top percentage of quality of life. You know, and it's not, I'm not saying we shouldn't strive to be number one, because we should. We should strive to be better. But what I am saying is let's be thankful for what we have now. You know, there's so much to be thankful for. You know, this, this poverty mentality, it, it, it's very dangerous because it also creates complainers. You know, when we don't get what we want, we complain. And how many of you have been around a complainer? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hands. You know, someone who sees negative in everything, it's just exhausting. And I know there's no complainers here, none here. <laughs> Amen? You know, it's no matter how much they get, they always find something wrong, and they complain. You know, and uh, I thought about this, you know, have you ever given a gift to a child? And this is like the most innocent example. Rachel and I have nine nieces and nephews, so we have some experience in giving good gifts. And, you know, it's Christmas time or birthday time, you scour the mall. You scour everything, you want to find the best gift. You find this gift, you're like, okay, this gift is going to blow their minds. <laughs> you're so excited, right? You wrap it up, you bring it to the house, it's time. Time for their minds to be blown. They take the gift, they open it, open it, open it, open it, and they go, oh, this one? <laughs> they didn't have the black one? <laughs> or the, this, is the, this is the best one. They open it and they go... Oh, we have this already. <laughs> and you're like, okay. <laughs> you know, that's the most innocent example. Like, or at work. You know, when you, you're at work and you just hear your colleagues constantly complaining about their pay. And, you know, and I'm not saying we should, like, we don't deserve better. I'm saying we shouldn't be grumbling about these things. You know, or when your spouse or parent and you cook the food. You know, for your kids. And the whole time you're cooking, making sure the meal is nutritious, making sure we're not going to have the same meal as yesterday, everything's good. And then your kids come in and they're like, I'm not hungry anymore, I don't want to eat this. <laughs> and it's just that, you know, that, that attitude of seeing what they have and just not having enough and just complaining about it. There's a quote that says, the worst person to be around is someone who complains about everything and appreciates nothing. Philippians 2, 14 to 15, it says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, and a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Church, we need to stop looking at our glass half empty, and we need to stop complaining. Because we believe in a God who will provide, Amen. We believe in a God who's going to do something for us, amen? And the grumbling won't do anything for us, but just destroy our spirits. Other than the poverty mindset, the next thing that makes us ungrateful is comparison. Robert Maddow, a pastor in the States, he says this, Comparison is the cancer to contentment. Craig Rochelle says this, The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. You know, in every aspect of life, whether it be physical things, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your talent, whether it be the family you have, when we start to compare our lives to others, we start to long for things. And we start to long for things we don't even need. You know, then we get upset when we don't get what we don't need. You know, it makes us discontent with our current life, our current situations. And you know, today, in our, in our day and age where social media is so prevalent, it's so hard not to compare. Because who here is on Facebook and Instagram? Add me. No. <laughs> no, but I'm, it's not a sin. I'm not saying it's a sin. But I'm saying, you know, it's hard when people constantly post the best of what they have. 
and they post the highlights of their life. And something inside of us just automatically goes and compares our life. And we look at our feed of all these different things and we say, I wish I had their looks. I wish I had their clothes. I wish I had their wealth. I wish I had their vacation. They're always on vacation. They're having so much fun. And I wish I had their intellect. They're saying so many smart things. I wish I could sing like them. I wish I could dance like them. You know, the Lord could have exactly answered your prayers, but, but your thankfulness is robbed when you compare it to something else. You know, an, an example is, you know, we could be praying to God for a new car. Amen? We're praying to God for a new car. And you know what? We're going to be specific with God. We're going to say, God, I want the BMW. And we pray, we pray, we pray. And God gives you the BMW. And then you scroll through your Instagram. Scrolling, 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 and you see your friend. Oh, your friend also has a new car. But they have a Lexus. It's a newer model, and it's fully loaded. And all of a sudden, the blessing of the BMW, all of a sudden, your thankfulness, your happiness is gone. Because you compared it to something else. You know, he could have answered your prayer just like you asked. But when we compare it to something else, you know, it kills our thankfulness. You know, it could be the same thing where you're, you're, you know, you're praying for your promotion. You know, you're praying for the job. You're praying, God, I need an increase in salary. So I'm going to pray for this promotion and I believe you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, you get the job. You get the promotion. Then you're in your lunchroom, okay? And you're, somehow, you hear the salary of somebody else, you know, in the room. And all of a sudden, what you now are earning is not enough. You know, we lose our thankfulness because we compare it to something else and we think, oh man, they're earning this, I'm just earning this. Oh. You know, or how about this one? You know, when you're praying for your husband to do more around the house. <laughs> you can pray for your husband, I'm praying for him to help out. And then what he does, he starts to help. Praise God. He starts to clean. Praise God. He starts to help with the dinner. Praise God. And then you look at Instagram. And you see uh, one of your friends, her, her husband brought her to the spa. <laughs> and, and brought her on vacation. And you start to think, oh man, I wish you were more like that person. <laughs> you see, when we continue to emphasize what others have, our contentment is lost. When we continue to compare what we have to what they have, it's lost. Comparison is the cancer to contentment. Church, we need to stop comparing. You know, when we think about the things we're actually com comparing to, the things that we want, more often than, than not, are these desires that we don't even need. And the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, it says this, Don't set the affections of your heart on this world, or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of things of the world, the obsession with status and importance, none of these things come from the Father but from the world. This world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love to do the will of God live forever. You see, most of the time the things that we want the things that cause us unhappiness or, or, or discontent because we don't have them, they're things that are meaningless to begin with. You know, the Bible says that they're in the process of passing away. You know, all the things that we want, it says the things of the world, the obsession with status, the obsession with importance, they all pass away. So comparing it brings no benefit to us. You know, the, the unusual thing, and Pastor Jay tells us this all the time, is the unusual thing is, when we do compare, we, we never compare to those who have less than us. You know, if, if we were to stop and actually compare to those who have less than us, we'll realize we have more than enough. You know, and about two years ago, Compassion Canada, which is a great program um, that pairs children up with sponsor families to help them with needs, came to our church, and you know, a lot of us signed up to help those in need. And when I was preparing this message, I just thought of, man, why am, I, why am I comparing about things that 
like I need it and I want, but I, I look at these kids and I think they don't have much. You know, and if we, we were to compare to those who have less than us, we'd realize that we have more than enough. And that God has been so good to us. You know, we have more than enough to be grateful for. So don't let comparison create ungratefulness for the blessings that we have today. Amen? You still love me? Am I still? Can I still come back? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> The next thing is, okay, so there's two, there's the two things on how we become ungrateful, why we do that. But now the question is, is, how can we unlock thankfulness? How can I make thankfulness become more of my life? And the first thing is, we need to acknowledge what you have. You know, we need to know that we are blessed. Amen? We are blessed. Amen? Amen. We are blessed. Amen? Amen? You know, even though we have needs... We must acknowledge that He has given us much. And He's given us good things. In the story of the five loaves and two fish, you know, they only had five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000. But the reality is, is that they did have. Even though it was small, they did have. And God used it. And today you might be looking at yourself and say, what I do have is small. But praise God that what you do have something. Amen? And though it's small, God can use it. James 1, 16 and 17 says, Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting sh shadows. The clothes we have, the food we eat, the place we worship He has given the breath in our lungs He has given. The family and friends that we love He has given. The spouse we have He has given. Everything He has provided. And you can sit here today and say, Paul, I worked for everything that I have. You can say, I go to work every day. I do my, my job. I earn everything I have. You could be there like that today. But I say, who gives you the ability to work? Who gives you the strength to wake up each morning? Who works on our behalf and places our feet in order? Who grants us the wisdom that we need? Who grants us the favor we need for the promotions that we step into? Church, when we acknowledge what He has given us, we enter into that state of thankfulness. And we also enter into that state of contentment, which is a place of peace. You know, the, the word content means to be satisfied. You know, and yes, we have real needs. We have bills to pay. You know, we have to feed our children. But what we have right now is more often more than enough. In 1 Timothy 6, 6-10 it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You know, I like that part. We were brought into the world with nothing. And we will leave with nothing. But if we have food, if we have clothing, we'll be content with that. Friends, we'll leave this world with nothing. So let's not fall into the trap of chasing after these possessions, chasing after things that are in the process of passing away. You know, and again, I'm not saying don't aspire to do great things. I'm not saying live as a hermit and never ask for promotion or salary or anything like that. And I'm saying earn more for your family. We're the top and not the bottom, amen? amen? I'm saying let's not lose sight of being thankful for what we already have because we're fo too focused chasing what we actually do not need. You know, because you can't say God has not provided when you have a car, when you have a house, when you have food on the table, when you're sitting here today with good health, amen? amen. You know, maybe we don't have the five-bedroom Four washroom house, or, or the Lexus in the driveway, or we're not eating filet mignon every night. 
But we can't say that God has not provided. Because God has provided. Amen. Take the moment to think about it, even right now. You know what? He has provided for you. Even if it may be small, our testimony today is that God has provided. And we need to take the moment to be thankful for it. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss the moment. So not only do we need to acknowledge what we have, we need to recognize who we have. Amen? We need to recognize who we have. You know, we need to understand who our Father is and how much He cares for us. He's a God who understands our every need. And He already has a plan. You know, again, in John 6, when He was talking to Philip about feeding the 5,000, it's so important to know that He already had a plan. He already knew what He was going to do. Church, in your need today, God already knows what He is going to do. And we can be thankful because we serve a God who will always meet the need. Always meet the need. In Romans 8.28, it says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You know, God works for the good. You know, there's a song that we sang, we had soaking night, I think it was two weeks ago. And if you know the song Waymaker, there's a song called Waymaker, and there's a bridge, and I love the bridge of this song. And this is how it goes, I'm not going to sing it, but <laughs> this is how it goes, it goes, <laughs> some, some of you are saying it. It says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Wow. You never stop working. You know, this is so powerful. We think of the verse of Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. You know, it just speaks to the nature of God that even when you don't see it, He's working. Even when you don't feel it, He's working. He never stops working. Even when you're resting and when you're sleeping, He's working. When you're sick or we're sitting here, He's working on our behalf. Amen. And that's the God we serve. A God who's always working for us. A God who holds the master plan. Thank God He's not following my plan. Thank God He's not following my plan. There's so many times I look back and say, I look at how God did things and I'm like, Yep, that was the better way. That was the better way. <laughs> Thank you, God. Even when we don't see it, He's working. You know, and, and He not only has the plan, but He also, He carries our burdens, and He carries our anxieties. In Philippians 4, 6-7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, my prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, we can come to Him, we can present our prayers, we can present our supplications, we can present our anxieties with thanksgiving, and He'll respond. You know, I love this verse. Because if you think about it, it's a really don't miss the moment verse. Because what does it say? It says, don't be anxious. Come to me with what you need, but come with thanksgiving. Take the moment of thankfulness. You know, when you come with your list of things, when you come with your worries, your burdens, your anxieties, when you come, don't miss the moment of thankfulness. Not because God needs our appreciation, not because He needs, but when we start to thank God, we come to Him with our, our, our petitions, our requests, when we start to thank God, it starts to put Him back in His place. It starts to remind us. It reminds us what He's already done. It reminds us of His track record. It reminds us of how He's already earned our trust. You know, we come with our petitions and we thank God and we remember these things. We remember we can trust Him. We remember we can love Him. We remember He always comes through. And what happens? The peace 
of God comes over us. You know, and He takes all our worries and anxieties. You know, He's more than able. The Bible says He can do immeasurably more. Immeasurably. can't measure more than we can ask. Think of the need you have right now. We all have needs. He can meet it in Jesus' name. If you have a financial here today, He can meet it in Jesus' name. You know, according to Forbes, I was looking at the richest man in the world. That could be female too. Richest person in the world. And the richest person in the world is Jeff Bezos right now. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah. So he's the founder of Amazon. Okay, guess how much he's worth. How much? What do we have over here? Trillion? Wow. <laughs> Anybody else? Six billion. Eighteen billion. Can I get a nineteen billion? Can I get a soul? Uh, no. Okay, so are you ready? Right now, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, according to Forbes, $131 billion. You know, they put that, it wasn't 130, it was 131, just to like. <laughs> $131 billion. And if you're like me, you hear this, and you're thinking, man, what can I do with $131 billion? You think about your, your needs, and you'd be like, yep, yeah, that would be gone, that would be gone, that would be gone, that would be gone. Yep, yeah, I have this, I have this. $131 billion. But church, what's $131 billion in comparison to the riches of God? Amen? What is it? What's $131 billion in comparison to what God has? All the riches belong to Him. In, in Psalms 147 verse 8, Who covers the heavens with clouds? Who provides rain for the earth? Who makes grass to grow on the mountains? There's none like God. Amen? You know, David puts it beautifully in his prayer. 1 Chronicles 29, 11-13. I love this. It says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor, they come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you. <coughs> you thanks and praise your glorious name. You know, we can give thanks to God because we know He holds all things. We know He's a good God. We know we can trust Him with the needs and like David, we can say, God, everything you have, all the riches in the world belongs to you. All the strength in the world belongs to you. At just one instant, He can open the floodgates of heaven and all the riches can come to you. In just that moment, we can say, God, you're doing all these things. You own all of these things. You're this great. And you're working on my behalf. And I'm thankful to you. You know, friends, so often, sometimes we're a bit discouraged because we confuse God's timing and we associate it with a lack of ability. But today, friends, if you have a, a need that is unmet, don't think it's because He's not able. He's more than able. It's just His timing and your timing may be different. You know, Ecclesiastes 3, it speaks about a time for everything. A time to reap, a time to sow, a time to mourn, a time to rejoice. You know, in, 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 in verse 11, it says, He will make everything beautiful in its time. His plan and your plan are different. So let's not confuse it. Sometimes we say, oh, He's not doing it. He can't do it. But really, it's because the timing is different. And his plan is different. But he's more than able. He's the God who painted the stars in the sky. He's the God who breathed life into you, who knit you in your mother's womb. So I want to encourage you that today, even today, if you're here, God is a big God. And whatever your need is, he's able. So don't lose hope. Even if you're in the middle right now, middle of that transition, middle of that moment where you have, you know, a big need and you have a you just have just a little bit. God is more than able. Amen?
So let's acknowledge Him and be thankful. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss the moment. <laughs> Finally, one more. Everybody say, one more. One more. One more and then Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> one more and then turkey or chicken. Okay. So, you know, we need to acknowledge what we have, recognize who we have in the last thing, is we need to continually praise God. You know, we need to develop a habit of praise. You know, you might be here and you're thinking, you know, are praise and thankfulness the same thing? You know, they work hand in hand, but they're very different. And developing a habit of praising God, it will help that thankful attitude come forth. So let me give you an example in a practical way. So, Rachel's my wife, and, and if I was to praise her, or I'll praise her, if I was to praise her, I would say, Okay, Rachel, you know, you're a loving person, you're compassionate, you're caring, you're a great mother, you're a strong leader. You know, this is me giving her praise for who she is and what she's done. Thankfulness is then seeing those characteristics and appreciating them for my life. Appreciating how they impact my life. You know, you can go and praise Rachel for what she's done. You, you can even pray and say, Paul, you did such a great job. That's it. But there's a relationship, you know, when we continue to praise, then it starts to open our minds to say, oh, <coughs> you know, Rachel's good at this stuff and I'm thankful for her. You know, the relationship is hand in hand. And in the same way, when we develop the habit of praising God, you know, giving praise for who He is, what He's done, it opens our eyes and hearts to reflect on Him. You know, it opens us to just continually think about who He is, and then it makes us appreciate Him. It makes us more thankful towards Him. You know, and some of us, we might not have a thankful attitude because we don't practice praise. We don't have the habit of praise. You know, we're not lifting God every day. We're not acknowledging what He does. We're not acknowledging who He is. And it's hard for us to see how we can appreciate those things because we don't highlight them. You know, we, we need to develop this habit of praise. You know, we use praise around here a lot. And you might get confused because, you know, we do have praise and worship here. And I'm not saying you have to go around every day and practice singing fast songs like around all the time. That's not what I'm saying. Because we know that praise is not just a fast song. You often hear us as worship leaders. You know, I do worship also in Brampton. And you often hear us say as worship leaders, you know, God's worthiness of praise is independent on our current situation. Because it's not based on our emotions. You know, God is worthy of our praise even if nothing changes in our lives. Amen? You know, what, what's happening in our lives doesn't change who He is. What we're feeling doesn't change who He is. He's sovereign. He's almighty. You know, the Bible says that we're even commanded to praise Him. In Psalms 150 verse 6, it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know, when we praise, it, it, what it does is it focuses us on the bigness of God. His characteristics. You know, that He's the Creator, He's the Almighty God, He's the Healer. And it places Him on top, back on top of everything, and back where we belong. You know, and I'm saying this because developing a habit of praise is a decision. You know, something that you won't wake up and just be like, I'm going to praise God today. It's something that we have to decide to do, and we need to develop it in our spiritual nature, and, you know, mature that in our lives, to really develop that habit of saying, okay, God... I don't feel like it, but you are my healer. You are the creator. You are Lord of all. You're sovereign. You're my savior. These are things that never change. You know, the Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he qualifies for our praise yesterday, today, and forever. You know, and that relationship between praise and thanksgiving, you know, I praise God that you're the provider, and then you start to think, and I thank you because you have provided for me. I praise you because you're the healer, and I thank you, God. I'm sitting here with good health. You know, devoting time each day to praise God for who He is and what He has done, it will make you easy to be thankful. You know, the, but the thing is, the problem is, is that sometimes we put conditions on our praise. Right? Sometimes we treat God like He was created for us. 
instead of us being created for Him. And this really hit me, it hit me really hard because I was like, oh man, Lord. Because sometimes we treat Him like, you know, He was made to meet all of our needs. But God made us. You know, He wasn't made to, he, he wasn't, He's not obligated to give you good things, but He does. Out of the goodness of His heart, out of the nature of who He is. <coughs> We're the ones who are actually commanded to praise Him because He created us. Amen? Him giving us breath alone, the Almighty Creator, is enough qualification for us to praise Him all the days of our lives. What more? His provision, His freedom from sin, His salvation, His relationship with Him and us. What more? We can praise Him. We need to develop this habit. You know, we need to choose to decide it daily. So if you have quiet time with God every day, practice praise. Like, continue to do it. And you'll realize that you'll be more thankful. You know, when the tough seasons in life happen, because you've developed that habit, your thankfulness will still run. Amen? It says here in Ephesians 5, 19 to 20, Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So church, I encourage you on Sundays to please come on time. Because, it's not because, you know, Sister Marika wants you to hear her sing. But it's because we believe here that praise is so important. And it sets the tone for everything else. You might just be like, well, I just, I like the worship, so I'm going to come to the worship time. But praise is so important because what it does is it starts us off and it postures us in the right place. And it, and, it, and it gives God the glory that He deserves. And that's how we want to start every Sunday. And every day of our lives that we give God what He deserves. So if you want to practice praise, come on time on Sundays. Be here. So that we can give Him what He deserves. We can give Him that, that short time where we can praise Him for who He is. So let's be the church that continually praises God. So I'd like to call the worship team up with me as I close. So we need to acknowledge what we have, recognize who we have, and continually praise God. So church this weekend, let's not miss the moment, especially on Thanksgiving weekend. If there's anything that you should leave with today, it's that there's so much to be thankful for. God is good, and He's earned our appreciation. My prayer is that we take the time to be thankful for our friends, thankful for our families, thankful for what we have, but more importantly, be thankful to God, who has given us all these things. You know, that we don't breeze by the moment of thankfulness. You know, moving from what we need to getting it, to what we need, to getting it, to getting it. But we take the moment like Jesus. You know, Jesus, the five loaves of two fish. Seeing the big need, looking at what he had, and still choosing to give thanks. You know, today, in this moment, we are more than blessed, and we serve a God who will meet all of our needs. Let's be a church who chooses to praise, chooses to be thankful in all circumstances, even past this weekend. And when the trials come, and when the need is so big, that we still be thankful. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice! always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So I want to do two things with you as a church today. And the first is I want us to corporately lift up a prayer of thanksgiving. Because God deserves it. Amen. So if you're comfortable, please stand and we'll offer a moment. So just in this, in this minute, I want you to think about your life. I want us to take this moment to reflect on what we have, who we have, 
and just choose to thank God. So in your, in your own words, you don't have to shout, you don't have to scream, but even in a small voice, just to thank God. We're going to take this one minute just to not miss the moment. Because we can breeze past this, but we need to take that moment and be thankful for what God has given. Let's take that moment.